clearances. And meanwhile, we have a major news breaking report tonight from Sarah Carter, including bizarre newly unearthed text between Christopher Steele and DOJ official Bruce Orr. This is a smoking gun text about firewalls just before Comey's 2017 appearance before Congress. You don't want to miss this report. Also tonight, we will cover day 12 of the trial of the century. Paul Manafort's 2005 tax and bank fraud trial. Closing arguments are now over. Jury instructions have been given. And by the way, we'll watch it closely. And as the midterms inch closer, we will reveal how some on the left, they are now ramping up their divisive rhetoric, just as we have predicted. And we'll also wish a very happy birthday to the leader of the Democratic Party, Maxine Waters. All right, sit tight for tonight's breaking news, jam-packed opening monologue. All right, so after years of serious misconduct, former CIA chief and Obama sycophant John Brennan can kiss his security clearance bye-bye. Today, President Trump stripped Brennan's special government access. Now, Sarah Sanders announced this decision earlier today. Take a look. I've decided to revoke the security clearance of John Brennan, former director of the Central Intelligence Agency. At this point in my administration, any benefits that senior officials might glean from consultations with Mr. Brennan are now outweighed by the risks posed by his erratic conduct and behavior. Second, that conduct and behavior has tested and far exceeded the limits of any professional courtesy that may have been due to him. Mr. Brennan has a history that calls into question his objectivity and credibility. I am evaluating action with respect to the following individuals. James Clapper, James Comey, Michael Hayden, Sally Yates, Susan Rice, Andrew McCabe, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, and Bruce Orr. Security clearances for those who still have them may be revoked, and those who have already lost their security clearance may not be able to have it reinstated. It is about time. For months right here on this program, we have been calling out Brennan over a serious and blatant abuse of power. For example, during his time as Obama CIA director, John Brennan was responsible for the proliferation of Christopher Steele's dirty dossier in an effort to take down then-candidate Donald Trump and legitimize salacious, unverified claims, Russian lies found in that dossier. Brennan actually leaked its contents to then-Senator Harry Reid, who then subsequently alerted the public in an open letter to James Comey. He pushed Hillary Clinton's Russian lies to purposely deceive and lie to you, the American people. Why? So he could sway an election. And despite all of this, remember, Brennan told Congress, well, oh, the CIA did not make use of the dirty dossier. That was a flat out lie. And that, my friends, is a gross abuse of power. Brennan literally tried to use your federal government to weaponize the Clinton campaign's phony Russian opposition research against Donald Trump. It's beyond disgusting. And by the way, he's a walking, talking representative of why the American people do not have faith and trust in their government. And by the way, and speaking of talking, after stepping down as CIA director, John Brennan, well, he's done a lot of it. In fact, he took all his hatred of Donald Trump from the highest levels of the CIA, abusing his power, to his new job. He's now paid by a so-called news agency, Conspiracy TV, MSNBC, so-called news channel. He continues to peddle all this propaganda and misinformation and disinformation. How fitting. Take a look at the conduct from a former so-called nonpartisan CIA director who once had his fingers on every American secret we have. Watch this. Donald Trump has badly sullied the reputation of the office of the presidency with his invective, with his constant um, disregard, I think, for human decency. He is, I think, the most divisive president we've ever had in the Oval Office. He is feeding and fueling uh, hatred and animosity and misunderstandings among Americans. I think there's a big question, first of all, in terms of those who are on Mr. Trump's national security team, whether they can and continue to serve in good conscience an individual who basically betrayed his nation. What Mr. Trump did yesterday was to betray the women and men of the FBI, the CIA, NSA, and others, and to betray the American public. And that's why I use the term that this is nothing short of treasonous. 
I think he's afraid of the president of Russia. Why? Um, well, I think one can speculate as to why. Uh, that the Russians may have something on him personally uh, that they could always roll out and make his life more difficult. Mr. Trump continues to have his uh, ignorance of the facts or willful disregard of them. Again, just to uh, follow through on these campaign promises that really were uh, very flawed. I and so many other former national security uh, officials are speaking out because of the uh, abnormal and aberrant uh, behavior uh, of uh, Mr. Trump. This is a very large and painful national kidney stone. <laughs> the relief we feel afterward is going to be just <laughs> exhilarating. Now, for anybody that thinks that that man, that Trump-hating partisan, MSNBC hack, should have a security clearance, let me make this very simple and easy to understand. And by the way, I'll read to you from the official CIA rules. And by the way, all of you biased hacks in the media, you need to do your jobs. You need to tell your audiences the truth what the rules of the CIA are. Quote, in the case of former directors, the agency holds their security clearance and renews it every five years for the rest of their lives. However, that requires former CIA directors to behave like current CIA employees. So is what you saw, is that, you know, a man demeaning a sitting president of the United States on a daily basis on national TV? Is that acceptable behavior for a sitting member of the CIA? Of course not. But the always indignant John Brennan, he's lashing out yet again today, writing on Twitter, quote, this action is part of a broader effort by Mr. Trump to suppress freedom of speech and punish critics. It should gravely worry all Americans, including intelligence professionals, about the cost of speaking out. My principles are worth far more than clearances. I will not relent. Uh, Mr. Brennan then followed that up with a more vitriolic appearance on, yeah, Conspiracy TV, NBC. Take a look. I do believe that uh, Mr. Trump decided to take this uh, action, as he's done with others, to try to intimidate and suppress any criticism of him or his administration. And um, revoking my security clearances uh, is his way of trying to get back at me. I've seen this type of behavior and actions on the part of foreign tyrants and despots and autocrats for many, many years during my CIA and national security career. I never, ever thought that I would see it here in the United States. And so I, I do believe that all Americans really need to take stock of what is happening right now in our government. I love getting lectured from former communists. This country is a better place tonight without that man having his fingers on America's most sensitive secrets. How a former communist ever became Barack Obama's CIA director is another insane part of all of this. Now, meanwhile, as Sarah Sanders announced, nine other current or former official security clearances are also under review, including the liar, the leaker that is known as James Clapper. That would include James Comey, Andrew McCabe, Susan Rice, Peter Strzok, Bruce Orr, and others. My advice, clean it up. Now, get rid of all these clearances. We could easily make the case all night tonight each of these disgraced or fired officials should lose their clearances permanently, but we'd have to take all night. But we do once again have other breaking news to talk about, about one of the people on that list. According to an exclusive report from Sarah Carter, we now have smoking gun evidence of the very special relationship between demoted DOJ official Bruce Orr and ex-foreign spy Christopher Steele, who put that phony dossier together. Carter has uncovered yet another series of texts tonight between Orr and Steele. In one text, look at this, Christopher Steele expressing concern about James Comey's 2017 congressional testimony, writing two days before that testimony. Hi, just wondering if you had any news. Obviously, we're a bit apprehensive given the schedule appearance at Congress on Monday, hoping that important firewalls will hold. Many thanks. All rights back. Sorry. No new news. I believe my earlier information is still accurate. I'll let you know immediately if there's any change. Sounds like the firewall's in place. What are these firewalls? 
What did Christopher Steele have to hide? And what was Bruce Orr trying to cover up? And why was Monday so important, as we said? Well, that's the day that James Comey was set to testify before Congress, and Steele was afraid. Let's see, we know of the Senate Intel Committee and their scrutiny. He was afraid of media scrutiny. He wanted a firewall to hold. Firewalls, plural. Bruce Orr, Steele, had at least, we now know, 70 contacts. And meanwhile, Steele was just desperate to get his dossier in the hands of Robert Mueller. And under oath in Great Britain, we know that he couldn't even stand by his own fake claims in his Clinton bought and paid for dossier. He said, uh, it's just raw intelligence. I don't know if it's true. Now, why is Orr still working at the DOJ? Why his wife worked for Fusion GPS? What was her role? Remember, we just discovered that they had another client besides Clinton. We just learned a Kremlin, a Thai lawyer, and Russian oligarch. So Fusion GPS is being paid by them and the Clintons? And what about Glenn Simpson from Fusion GPS meeting with that Kremlin lawyer both before and after the now infamous 2016 Trump Tower meeting? That doesn't sound fishy to you? Mark it down on your calendar. These questions must be posed to Bruce Orr when he testifies before Congress on August the 28th. By the way, why aren't those hearings public? We reached out to Orr for comment. Shockingly, didn't receive a reply. Sarah Carter, Carter will have more details in her report. She'll join us in a few minutes. But first, we do have an update on the media's trial of the century. After just 12 days, closing arguments on both sides have now come to an end. Paul Manafort's defense is clearly relying on the terrible credibility of the prosecution star witness, and that's Manafort's former business partner, Rick Gates. Despite him admitting to numerous felonies, T. Muller provided Gates with a get-out-of-jail-free card in exchange for his testimony. It's like the case of, remember, Sammy the Bull Gravano, the gangster, who killed up to 19 people. And by the way, it's so many other seedy individuals that our justice system frequently offers up sentencing, get-out-of-jail-free cards, prosecutorial bribes, if you will, in exchange for testimony. It's a serious problem, frequently resulting in less than trustworthy testimony. But in the case of Paul Manafort, well, we should all be prepared, frankly, for a guilty verdict, and I'll tell you why. 95% of federal cases end up that way. And while the media, they'll cheer in unison if Paul Manafort is found guilty, you must remember this. This case of Mueller had nothing, zero to do with Russia, zero to do with collusion, nothing to do with Manafort's work on the campaign, and zero to do with Donald Trump. Why are we even here? We'll have more on this throughout the show. But now we turn to the midterm elections, which are only 83 days away. And as we predicted, well, the language of the left is getting downright disgusting, as it does every two to four years. In Tennessee, Democrats Steve Cohen urged Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn, who's running for the Senate, to jump off her bridge. By the way, they go high, we go, oh, something like that. Take a look. The big orange president, that's not somebody from Knoxville. He's going to come down here and he's going to endorse Marsha Blackman. Because Marsha Blackman, if he says, jump off the Harahan Bridge, she'll jump off the Harahan Bridge. I wish he'd say that. <laughs> And if you really want to know how pathetic the Democratic Party is, well, just look at New York. It's governor, Democratic uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo announcing his brand new campaign slogan. I'm not making it up. You have to see it to believe it. Take a look. We're not going to make America great again. It was never that great. <laughs> we have not reached greatness. We will reach greatness when every American is fully engaged. Accumulated more power and abused it less than the United States. That has accumulated more power and used it to advance the human condition around the world more than the United States of America. It doesn't exist. No, we're not perfect. This is the same America that beat back fascism and communism and Nazism and Imperial Japan and has stood for human rights and dignity all around the world at great cost to this country. Now, of course, what segments on America's left would be complete without an overt threat to the President of the United States? Take a look. This poster from the band Pearl Jam showing what appears to be the skeletal remains of a dead President Trump outside a burning White House. And while Pearl Jam apparently wants the President to go down in flames, most Democrats, they'll just settle for impeachment 
It is the cornerstone of what is their political strategy for 83 days, should they win in November. And no one has been more upfront about this plan than the de facto leader of the Democratic Party, Maxine Waters. Let's take a look. Your birthday is on Wednesday. Yes. So, pre happy birthday. But on Wednesday, you. If, if, if you could be granted one birthday wish, what would that be? I guess now my biggest birthday wish would be that we're able to get a leader of this country who represents us. I would wish that we could remove him from office and go about getting the kind of president that we could all be proud of. And if he's not impeached, if he cannot be impeached, 2020 is coming up and I believe that American people are going to do the right thing for our country, stand up for what is right and get rid of this man who is embarrassing us all. Well, today, Maxine Waters' birthday wish it didn't come true, but President Trump did honor her. 80th birthday on Twitter. He wrote, quote, happy birthday to the leader of the Democratic Party, Maxine Waters. On this program, we'd also like to wish Congresswoman Waters a very happy birthday. And to celebrate, well, we put together a montage of the very best of the leader of the Democratic Party that would like to take power in 83 days. Take a look. The Senate Intel Committee with the House Reclaiming Intel my Committee. Time. Reclaiming with the Senate my time. Judiciary Reclaiming Committee. my time. Okay. Reclaiming Matter of fact, my time. Mr. Reclaiming Secretary, the, time. the time belongs to the gentlelady from California. Per perhaps, Mr. Chairman, I don't understand the rules because Reclaiming I thought I was time. allowed to answer questions. Just Reclaiming my time. Would you please explain the rules and do not take that away from my time? With this kind of inspiration, I will go and take Trump out tonight. And I will fight every day until he is impeached. Impeach 45. This is a bunch of scumbags. That's what they are. Those are very strong all words. Organized around making money. The fact that uh, he is wrapping his arms around Putin uh, while uh, Putin is continuing uh, to advance uh, into Korea. Now, from all of us who support the president and his agenda, keep it up, Congresswoman. Maxine Waters, now the most honest voice in the Democratic Party. All right, we've got a lot to get to tonight, including our breaking news. Joining us now, Fox News contributor, investigative reporter, Sarah Carter, the author of the New York Times number one bestseller three weeks in a row. By the way, Judge Janine is number two. The Russia hoax, the illicit scheme to clear Hillary Clinton and frame Donald Trump. She's mad at you because she was <laughs> number one till your book came out. Uh, I'm proud of both of you. You're both Thank dear you. friends of mine. Sarah, let's go directly to this text message, if I can read it, if you may. I think this is a smoking. I'm wondering if you had any news. Obviously, we're a bit apprehensive given scheduled appearances on Monday at Congress, hoping more important firewalls will hold. I believe my earlier information is still accurate. I'll let you know if anything changes. Uh, what are the firewalls? Sarah Carter, two days. Steele sends this to Orr before Comey's testimony. What are the well, yeah, firewalls before... that have been set in place? Well, this is before Comey's testimony before the House Intelligence Committee, Sean. And remember, this is where Comey announced that there was a counterintelligence investigation into the Trump campaign. So these firewalls are very important. This actually shows premeditation, in, in, my, in my opinion. It shows that they set up firewalls, which is very interesting, because Bruce Orr apparently was one of those firewalls. And apparently there was a lot more firewalls in place, a lot of other people actually communicating with Christopher Steele, possibly in the State Department and within the intelligence community. And they were moving this information in and out. Remember, it was a lot of the same information that they tried to use inside the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court application against Carter Page so that they could spy on the Trump campaign. And it wasn't just Carter Page. Let me make myself clear here. When they are listening to telephone conversations and gathering emails from Carter Page, they are also looking at second and tertiary people in communication with Carter Page. So it was everybody that was connected to Carter Page. And Sean, I believe this is a smoking gun. They need to ask Bruce Orr what those firewalls were and are and exactly how his involvement in this was, because he does talk about information that he supplied Christopher Steele earlier. 70 contacts, text messages, emails, meetings, and of course, or his wife works with Fusion GPS. 
uh, firewalls before Comey's testimony, uh, earlier information he provided. Firewalls sound like they had a plan. Sounds a lot like, oh, an insurance policy to me. Greg Jarrett. Well, I think you're right. And in fact, here's 60 pages worth of the text messages, emails, and the notes of Bruce Orr and his conversations with Christopher Steele spanning a full year. What's remarkable about these documents, and Sarah's reporting is exactly right, is on the one hand, furiously Steele is trying to communicate with the FBI through Bruce Orr after Steele has been fired for being a liar. He's also trying to get in contact with Robert Mueller and his special counsel team. But at the same time, he is frantic and worried that he's going to get busted uh, for all of the illegal things he has been doing. Uh, in one text message, he's, he's concerned that Grassley's letter will implicate him. Then he's worried in another text that Comey is going to expose him in Congress. And still another, he's worried about questions from the Senate Intelligence Committee that are being sent to him. This is a guy who's worried about getting busted for all of his think wrongdoing. About that. He's worried about Grassley, the Senate Intel Committee. He, he's married about Comey. He's also worried in text about, uh, uh, about the media. Let me go back to the 70 contacts, but more importantly, Orr and Steele are talking about getting his phony dossier that he didn't stand up for under oath in Great Britain to special counsel Mueller. So that too is a big piece of this now emerging puzzle that is beginning to come together, Sarah. It Absolutely. I mean, they wanted to get this dossier to Mueller. We know that this dossier was used as the bulk for the warrant to spy on Carter Page. But even more importantly, Sean, you know, Steele was in communication with a Russian who was living here in America as well. He was in communication with Glenn Simpson. He was must have been in communication with other Russians, former KGB, FSB people that were living in Europe and possibly in communication with people in Russia. Uh, and even more interestingly enough, now we know I and we've reported before this. And after. I love That's the fact right. that the, the, lawyer, the Russian lawyer was a client of Fusion GPS. Natalia, yeah, Natalia Veselnitskaya, who was the attorney, yes, yeah, was, was in communication with Glenn Simpson before and after. Absolutely. All right. Uh, amazing report, Sarah. Greg, three weeks in running, number one in the New York Times. We're proud of Thank you. you. Thank you. The information is critical in your book. Thank you very much. We have much. a lot more to come tonight. Kristen Fisher, new information on these abuse allegations surrounding Deputy DNC Chairman Keith Ellison, also Alan Dershowitz, David Schoen. They will react to this breaking news. And the great one, Mark Levin. Busy news night. Stay with us. DNC chairman now commenting on the abuse allegations made about Congressman Keith Ellison. Allegations the Democratic congressman is now adamantly denying. Joining us now live from Washington with more is our own Kristen Fisher. Kristen. Hey, good evening. So, you know, it appears that these domestic abuse allegations ended up having very little impact on the outcome of this race. Congressman Keith Ellison easily won the Democratic primary for Minnesota Attorney General, even though just days earlier he was accused of emotional and physical abuse by an ex-girlfriend. Over the weekend, her son alleged on Facebook that he had seen angry text messages from Ellison to his mother and a video showing him dragging her off a of bed. But so far that video has not surfaced and Ellison is adamantly denying all charges and he addressed the allegations head on during his victory speech last night. Listen here. We had... Um uh, uh, a very um, unexpected um, event at the end of this campaign. That happened. I want to assure you that it is not true. And we are going to keep on fighting all the way through. And the six-term congressman also serves as the deputy chairman of the DNC. It's a little bit of an awkward spot to be in because the DNC is now reviewing these allegations of domestic abuse. The committee's chairman says he takes it very seriously, though he downplayed the impact that this could have heading into the midterms. And, you know, Minnesota shaping up to be a critical state in November. And don't forget, Sean, Minnesota is still reeling from the resignation of Senator Al Franken just last year. Sean?
All right, Kristen, thank you for that report. And joining us now with reaction to tonight's opening monologue, the author of another best-selling book, The Case Against Impeaching Trump, Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz. By the way, he has a great book. And criminal defense attorney David Schoen. Uh, Professor Dershowitz, let me begin with you. I think that Sarah's report tonight, what are the firewalls? Well, I don't have any new information. I, it sounds very I have, nefarious and damning to me. Well, I have no idea. That's why right from the beginning I've called for a nonpartisan, complete investigation by experts to all aspects of this whole election. We have to get to the bottom of this. We have to have testimony that's open to the public, not behind closed doors of a grand jury. The American public is entitled to know what these things mean. I have no idea what these firewalls were referring to, but it's certainly enough to open up some kind of an investigation. But can I comment just briefly on your opening monologue? You know, I wrote a piece for the Boston Globe arguing that if the president revokes the security clearance only of his critics, that would raise a serious First Amendment question. It would be a close question because, after all, he's not shutting them down. These people can still say what they want and criticize, and they just don't have access to the uh, material. And if they uh, don't have access to the material, if they're being in some way punished, for their expression of political views, then I think you can have some First Amendment issues that are, are raised. I don't know how the case would come out. It's similar in some ways to a case that Professor, happened during me, the Vietnam War. Let me read to you War again. I think this when, is important. Yeah, I, CIA's rules. In case of former direct, uh, directors, the agency holds their security clearance right. and renews it every five years for the rest of their lives. However, that requires former CIA directors to behave like current CIA employees. You cannot make the case that Mr. Brennan in any way is conducting himself like a current CIA employee. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. The question is, is this being applied across the board to people and are they looking at everybody's background? The you answer know, is if yes. the case went up to the Supreme Court, it would be just like the case involving the travel ban. The court would ask the question, are we allowed to look at the motive of the president in doing this, or do we just look at the action? The president clearly has the power to revoke security clearance, but if he does it for an impermissible purpose, that couldn't be the basis for criminal charges, but it could be the basis for a constitutional violation. I'm I, saying I it's would a argue close that the president, there's probably a lot uh, more to come under the First I, I, Amendment. I think if we go apply the standard that I just read to you, and you agree, mm -hmm. it's applicable. Yeah. Um, there's no yeah. there's no ambiguity here. He's not behaving like a current CIA employee. Uh, let me go back to let David. Let me give you Show. a let hypothetical. Me go to David let me, for just, no, one let me just give you one quick hypothetical. Yeah, it's a quick hypothetical. Let's assume there was somebody who wasn't behaving like a CIA director, but was saying things positive about the president. Doesn't and matter. The president didn't revoke his security clearance. Then we'd have a serious question. This that is he was such doing an egregious, it on the content of the information. This is such an egregious abuse. You recognize it's not the case. Anybody with a common sense realizes no CIA employee can act this way. Former director. Let me go to David. David, I want to stay on this fire wall issue and at firewalls, plural. I cannot imagine why Christopher Steele is in contact 70 plus times, at least that we know of, with Bruce Orr and that the things that they're talking about and the urgency that he's, he's expressing prior to Comey's testimony. It's a shocking story, and as Professor Dershowitz said from the start, fr quite frankly, on the special counsel question, the special counsel regulations provided and provide that something short of a full investigation, especially the appointment of a special counsel, uh, is appropriate in a situation like this. There has to be a full hearing. It's not going to happen, certainly from Mr. Mueller on this question, and the DOJ, frankly, right now, has been missing in action. So I don't know who's going to carefully look into this. Sarah Carter's done a great job reporting it, but it has to be looked into. I'm going to jump back into one other question, one other issue. As Professor Dershowitz uh, recognized, with all, uh, all respect, as always with him, the president certainly has the authority and the exclusive authority on the question of Brennan's security clearance. Brennan has overstepped right. things here. And by the way, there's a history for this. President Obama isolated people whose views he didn't like or want to be associated with, like George Tenet, like Paul Wolfowitz, didn't include them in the briefing. It's true, we stopped short of revoking their security clearance. But why does Brennan need the security clearance at this point. He's misusing it and he's abusing it. I, I would argue that I think we're going to see probably more people. Clapper should be next. I believe uh, Susan Rice, the whole list of people, Bruce Orr, James Comey. And, and I would argue that's all going to happen. Professor, I want to go. The contacts, though, with Bruce Orr, you don't find that it's before the election. Well, by the way, one other thing. 
You also have the former CIA director disseminating lies, unverified lies to the American people vis-a-vis -vis Harry Reid. That's not the role of the CIA, Professor. That is a scary no, I agree. deep state and act. I think I, no, I, he should be criticized for it. Um, I, I know John Brennan. I like him. I thought he was a good director of the CIA. But I think he's gone uh, overboard in his criticism. And it makes it sound, when he makes criticism, that he knows it because he was in the CIA. He has some special information. And I think a former director of the CIA has to be much more discreet in his level of criticism. Having said that, I do think if the president denies security clearance only to his critics, he will be in court on the wrong side right, of the By the, the suit. way, I have an this update. This time the ACLU will bring the lawsuit because they uh, will bring Donald any Trump, lawsuit by the way, against Donald Trump. On the security clearances has now said I'd put a Republican on the list if they were incompetent or crazy. Well said. Um, we'll follow well, this in the well, days that's a good to come. Argument. Professor, congratulations on the success of your book, David Schoen. Always good to see you. When we come back, we'll continue this discussion. The great one, Mark Levin, joins us. That's next. All right, predictably, after Sarah Sanders announced that John Brennan's security clearance had been revoked, of course, the destroy Trump mainstream liberal media, of course, the extension of the Democratic Party had a complete meltdown. Let's take a look. This is without precedent in, in modern American history. I mean, security clearances have never been used to punish people for speaking out. This is nothing short of extraordinary, and we should all be scared about the state of our democracy. The president sent his White House press secretary out there today to basically poop on the people from the press secretary podium and th not only threaten, like they didn't just make a threat, it was a promise. They're snatching John Brennan's national security clearance. We begin tonight with a chilling action taken by the President of the United States that looks something like something you might see out of a dicta dictatorship or authoritarian regime. Trump is under fire for Nixonian enemies list tactics. Those are the accusations of at least one former FBI official after the White House is publicly admitting that it is retaliating against former CIA Director John Brennan. Joining us now, he's the host of CRTV's Levin TV, the host of Life, Liberty, Levin, Sunday night, right here on the Fox News Channel, number one in his slot. I call him the great one, Mark Levin. Mark, we have never had a former communist who literally, we now know, spread Russian lies to right. disinform, propagandize the American people to impact an, a presidential election either. Uh, these are unprecedented times. See if we can unravel this from the fabulously stupid Omarosa media. First of all, apparently the fact that Brennan voted for a Stalinist who was funded by the Soviets, the Communist Party USA, was very attractive to Barack Obama who made him CIA director. Think about that. So how did this man ever get a security clearance? I'm curious about this. Now a couple of things. The president is looking at Brennan. He revokes his security clearance. Professor Dershowitz needs to know that's a privilege. That's not a right of security uh, uh, privilege. The fact of the matter is nobody's stopping Brennan from speaking. In fact, nobody could stop. He has a big mouth. He will never shut up. He'll go on TV and be the kook that he is. The idea that he has a right to access to information because he served in the Obama administration at the CIA is a preposterous argument, but of course the ACLU will take up the case because they take up a lot of stupid cases. That's number one. Number two, who else is the president looking at? Comey. And people who are keeping score, Comey is a Republican. How many times have the media told us, Mueller's a Republican, Comey's a Republican, and even they questioned the president. Okay, you got a Republican. And by the way, for the media, most of these people the president are looking at are white. I know that's very important to you. Now, Comey was fired at the recommendation of Rosenstein. Comey was a leaker, and he absconded with government documents when he left. His security clearance should be pulled. McCabe is under criminal investigation. The number two from the FBI. Never before in history, media, his security clearance should be pulled. Peter Stroke was just fired, the guy in charge of counterintelligence investigations for misconduct. His security should be pulled. James Clapper committed perjury. He lied to the American people and Senator Wyden and that committee. Long time ago, his security clearance should have been pulled. Bruce Orr? Another one. Pulled. Yates, another one. 
not because the president has a problem with Democrats or liberals. He has a problem with these people. And we haven't even gotten to the unmasking issue yet. So this is not a First Amendment issue. Meanwhile, meanwhile, when these people had security clearances, what the hell did they do with them? Well, let's take a look. The Russians interfered in our election, right? Well, who was president? Who was head of the CIA? Who was national security advisor? Who was the head of the FBI? All these people, with their security clearances, in positions of power, did nothing effective to stop the Russians from interfering in our election. They did nothing to stop China from stealing our technology. They did nothing to stop North Korea's nuclear program. And even worse, they awarded the Islamo... Uh, Hold it, Mark. The terrorist regime in Tehran <laughs> with $150 billion, right? With $150 billion and provided them with a pathway to nuclear weapons. Good job, boys and girls in the Obama administration, with your security clearances. The fact that Obama appointed these people and gave them security clearances is not the obligation of this president to let them retain their security clearances. There is no constitutional issue. That's just nonsense. And again, one of them's a Republican, so that makes this all okay. Mark, I'd take away all their clearances. I'd take away all their clearances too, but the fact of the matter is, we really need to focus in on the conduct of these individuals. Look at the phony media and the arguments they're making. This is like a dictatorship. This is, this is a, we've never seen anything like this before. All these blabbermouths who know nothing, you're going to see Clapper on TV till you throw up on your loafers. You're going to see <laughs> Comey, he had his book thing. You're going to see Brennan all over the place, all these phony victims and so <laughs> forth and so on. Meanwhile, when they were in office, when they had their security clearances, when they had power, they didn't stop the Russians, they didn't stop the Red Chinese, they didn't stop the North Koreans, they funded the Iranians, and in fact, they are responsible for the greatest scandal in American history by interfering with our election and trying to undermine the Trump campaign. And the Trump presidency. Um, I think I'm going to remember, hold on, Mark, and uh, throw up on my loafers. But more importantly, that's why we call you the great one. Uh, great commentary. Mark Levin, thank you. Don't forget, you. Mark show, Life, Liberty, Levin, every Sunday night, 10 p.m., number one in its time slot, right here on the Fox News Channel. When we come back, Former CIA operative Daniel Hoffman, well, he's been very outspoken in his criticism of John Brennan and Sebastian Gorka. Next. All right, here now with reaction, President Trump revoking the S, former communist John Brennan security clearance, Fox News contributor, retired CIA senior intelligence officer, Dan Hoffman, and the author of Why We Fight, Fox News national security strategist, Sebastian Gorka. Both of you have been outspoken as it relates to Brennan. Uh, 35 years or so you spent your life, um, Dan Hoffman, in, in this type of business, let's put it that way. Yeah, I always felt like John Brennan should take the Hippocratic Oath of uh, respecting the privilege of holding security clearance and doing no harm to our national security when he was uh, enjoying his right to freedom of speech. And he, he did that tonight when he was speaking on MSNBC. This isn't about freedom of speech, as, as others have said on the show. But let me tell you, just from my experience at CIA, the concern that, that I and I think others would have is when foreign governments, not to mention spies, foreign spies stealing secrets on our behalf, hear John Brennan making unsubstantiated claims that Vladimir Putin could blackmail President Trump, they think, well, John Brennan must know something because, after all, he has a security clearance. And that's why John Brennan was causing or uh, risking great collateral damage to our national security. Well, I think, Dr. Gorka, they ought to take all these people's security clearances. Comey, Strunk, Page, the, the McCabe, the whole bunch of them. You know, but uh, this hack, if you look at his, he tried to peddle lies to the American people in his role as director, putting aside former directors must act as current CIA employees, which he is not doing. So, you know, as a matter of protocol, he, he, he's failed on every level. How did this guy even get a security clearance? Yeah, you just stole my thunder, Sean. Uh, 
issue number one. John Brennan should never have had a security clearance. He admitted in 1980 when he joined the CIA in a polygraph that he voted for the communists at the height of the Cold War when they wished to destroy us. Never should have had one. Uh, I love Alan Dershowitz, but this is not a civil rights freedom of speech issue. Nobody has the right to a security clearance. There's only one person who gets a security clearance automatically. And guess who it is? It's the president. Everybody else, it is a privilege of office. Dan Hoffman, myself, John Brennan, we have all taken an oath of office. I took it twice. I took it when I joined the Defense Department. I took it when I joined the White House. It says you will protect the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic, and you will bear faith, true faith and allegiance to the same. John Brennan has betrayed that oath of office, and he has betrayed his profession and the intelligence community every time he accuses the president of treason with no evidence. He is reprehensible, and he has betrayed his oath of office, Short. It is that serious. D Daniel, I, and I agree, Dr. Gorka, I, why is it just stick in my craw as CIA director that he literally perpetrated on the American people, spread misinformation, disinformation, by the way, right out of Pravda, right out of, you know, former Soviet Union uh, lies and propaganda, misinforming purposely the American people with unverified information. That bothers me as much as all that he's done after. I mean, I think that's a separate issue, frankly, about the extent to which he politicized intelligence and involved himself in politics. I think he was the most political director in, in, in my, over my career in the government of over 30 years. Uh, but I, I guess that's, to me, it's, it's probably a separate issue. This one is him abusing uh, the privilege that Absolutely. he enjoyed as, for having a security clearance. Yeah. But also, let's be clear. The clearance was designed so that he could go and help his successor. I don't think anyone's inviting him back uh, no. and asking for his assistance at this time anyways. Uh, uh, word, so Dr. regardless, Gorka. I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's, go ahead. Dr. Gorka. John Brennan supported Moscow during the Cold War, and he's still supporting the Kremlin today. That's who he is. He's not the first person who should be stripped of his clearance, and there should be more to follow, Sean. I'd strip the whole bunch of them. They're all corrupt. They've all abused their yep. power. They've all betrayed the American people with a political agenda. And so many of them tried to literally steal an election and influence an election in the United States. Thank you both. When we come back, Democrats continuing to embrace their far-left radical socialism be right back. Elizabeth Warren was asked if she was relieved Democrats are moving to the far left. Take a look. You were considered at the time the far left end of the Democratic Party. There has been a progressive wave, it seems, post the 2016 election. Are you uh -huh. surprised it took this long or are you?